So this is the process. Summer, fall of 2017, <coughs> prepar preparation and scoping. We're in the middle of doing that now. Uh, we are in the process of reviewing a uh, architectural assessment of the federal building. We have some other things that are going on, and hopefully we'll be prepared on September 11th for that um, council workshop. Winter 2017, council will have to direct how they wish to proceed with the bond and how to get it ready for voter consideration. Uh, in the spring of 2018, we will begin the, the public information process. Remember, we've used our uh, strategic plan. We've used the, uh, the citizen survey all as preparation to move this forward. So we will move that forward, have a lot of public meetings, and inform the public of the options. May of 2018 was when the bond election would occur. And again, 66 and two-thirds percent is the high number. It's more than the 51, or excuse me, we call it a supermajority. A lot of states have a 60 percent approval. State of Idaho is 66 and two-thirds percent. So it's a high hurdle, but we hope that if we can put together a package that uh, the public uh, will accept and wants the city to move forward, we will be able to do that. Okay, moving on to the overview of the budget process. It's a four-month preparation process. That is a conservative estimate. Really, as soon as we're done with the audit, we begin working on the budget. The audit is completed in late December, and we almost immediately begin working on budget process. We utilize the strategic plan. We incorporate the major challenge areas, and we look at prior council goals. At this point, the budget is balanced. That's a requirement of Idaho state law. It is mounts to a gross amount of $79,896,719. That includes $10 million of proposed bond revenues. So if, you're, if the bond would not, is not approved, then that number would be $69,896,719. During this presentation, we'll talk briefly about trends in comparison and go into budget highlights. Uh, the budget document has these purposes. It's a fiscal policy manual. We use it to guide our operations. It's our financial plan, although we're in the throes of completing a long-range financial plan. It is an annual and uh, biannual financial plan, and it's a communication device. If you go on the city's website, you can see uh, the budget. We have budgets that are available for folks to use. It's one of the most readable budgets that I've been involved in, and the idea is for transparent communication of the city's financial and operational goals. Uh, again, we talk about major challenge areas and some of these previous council goals that continue to be worked on. Uh, just very quickly, these are the different governmental funds and business type funds. I'll go through those for people who can't see them. The general fund is the catch-all fund for uh, most of the city's general operations, police, fire, um, general government, finance, uh, parks and rec, or excuse me, um, most of the things that you see every day. Uh, all of the things that make the city work from an administrative standpoint. Then we have special revenue funds, our street fund, parks and recreation, the community play fields, arts, 1912, community events, the transit center. Then we have construction funds. We have the capital projects funds, which is, is how we fund projects within the city of Moscow. LID construction and the Hamilton fund are also construction funds. Debt service funds, we have the bond and interest fund. That's where the funding for uh, property tax collection and payment of the Hamilton Low Aquatic Center bond would come from. It's where you will find the proposed $10 million revenue for uh, the proposed bond issue. Then we have business type funds. Enterprise funds, we call them water, sewer, and sanitation. These are the things that Idaho law allows the city to charge for uh, the reasonable provision of those services. We have three such funds, water, sewer, and sanitation. Those are the ones you get the utility bill for every month. Then we have internal service funds. Internal service funds are those funds that provide services to city departments, typically. <clears throat> so if you have a vehicle in your department, you will be charged for the replacement of that vehicle, the operation of that vehicle, the depreciation, the repair, and the operating costs. Information systems as well. The council all has iPads in front of them. The council's budget is, is credited with uh, a certain amount of money for information systems to provide services and infrastructure for that as well. Property taxes, where does it go? 
uh, dollars worth of property tax paid in the city of Moscow does not go to the city of Moscow. If you are charged a dollar within the city of Moscow, it's split up like so. Uh, city of Moscow takes 26.3 for our operations and capital. We have that one outstanding bond at 1.1%, brings it to 27.4% of that property tax dollar goes to the city. 35.6% and 2.8% go to the Moscow School District. Latah County is 23%, Cemetery 1.0, North Latah Highway District 7.3, and Latah County Free Library District 3.1%. So again, uh, out of a dollar of tax, property tax paid in the city of Moscow, the city is in fact receiving 27.4 cents. Okay, so what does that, what are the high points? The budget as proposed, 3% uh, <clears throat> property tax increase, the general fund would receive $5,471,087 of that. Uh, we have $174,129 in debt service. That is for the Hamilton Low Aquatic Center bond. The increase over fiscal year 2017 is 183125 As I indicated, about $160,000 of that is represented by the 3% property tax increase. $4.92 per $1,000 of assessed valuation. Uh, new construction value, uh, the 3% limitation is for um, limitation on the previous year's levy. You're also allowed to count any new construction that did not exist in the previous calendar year. So if a new house goes up, a new building goes up, then that is added as new construction. You apply your levy to that as well. And then you have your annexation value. In this case, it was about $341,000, which when you apply the city's levy to it, amounts to $1,632. That is the amount of property taxes out of a $79 million budget. Uh, that is supported by property tax. Okay, 2016 Idaho levies per thousand. This is the city of Moscow here. This is the average $7.50 per thousand. Moscow was at $4.73. So the city is fairly efficient with the funds that it, are, it is given. The city council has always recognized that because of the high percentage of uh, non or exempt property, non-taxable property in the city that uh, the folks in Moscow bear a high tax burden. So the council's always been very uh, circumspect about raising taxes. So that's why that levy is $2.80, if my math is correct, something like that, less than the average in the state of Idaho. Okay, 10-year comparison. Uh, where does the city's levy compare to all the taxes? And as you can see, this, we're comparing ourselves to Coeur d'Alene and Lewiston. Moscow is in the yellow here, so we've been fairly, um, if I have that correct, blue, sorry. <laughs> Don't want to be the yellow. Uh, so blue, as you can see. That's our we've friends been, down south. Yeah. <laughs> we've been fairly steady across. There have been some where, where property values go up, where the levy actually decreases, and then some that have been pretty steady. Lewiston, as you can see, is fairly flat across that same time. But as you can see, the percentage of levy going to the city itself is significantly less than our peers. Again, three largest taxing entities in Latah County. Uh, you've got Latah County in the green, Moscow School District in the gray, and City of Moscow in the orange. As you can see, the school district, because of the nature of uh, the fact that they have override levies, so on and so forth, they take a fairly large chunk of the tax dollar in order that they can provide the best educational system possible. But it does have impacts on the other partners, uh, being the county and the city. Exempt property estimates, and this goes back, these are, the, these are 2010 estimates based upon properties that are exempt from taxation. If you look over here, this is a 2017, or excuse me, 2016 valuation. As you can see, the numbers are almost equal. Again, these are 2010 estimates, and they're based on the valuation insurance value of improvements on tax-exempt property does not include the underlying land. So as you can see, we've got about $2.2 billion, $2.3 billion of value. Uh, in the city of Moscow, of which 1.15 is tax exempt. So uh, we are operating a city of about 25,000 residents on taxes generated from one half of the valuation of property in the city. 
So going through general fund revenues very quickly, as I indicated, total general fund revenues are $15,234,279. That is a 3.9% increase over fiscal year 2017. That is as a result of a 3% property tax increase. Remember, the, as I just showed you, out of that $15 million, about $15.6 million, or excuse me, $5.6 million is property tax. So we have other revenue sources as well. State share revenue, state sales tax, and state liquor tax. We've all seen incremental increases in those. Franchise fees, which we'll talk about a little bit as well. Franchise fees are charged on as a 3 or 5 percent um, percentage of all um, revenues generated by these utilities within the city of Moscow. So the electric, uh, Avista pays 3% of their gross revenues generated. Solid waste pays 5%, gas pays 3%, TV cable pays 5%. That is a state franchise, not a city franchise, but it still pays 5%. 911 emergency dispatch fees are a tax on cell phone and landline use. Building permit and plan revenues, we've got a few screens about that. Uh, these are the types of things that go into their permits and plan reviews. Then we have transfers in from water, <clears throat> sewer, sanitation, and streets. This is the value of um, services provided by general fund, uh, for instance, engineering, uh, finance, utility billing, administration, city attorney's office, uh, building department, so on and so forth, provided to the enterprise funds. Just like anything else, it costs money in order to administer, provide legal services, engineering services, so on and so forth. And then we have fund balance. And fund balance is essentially what's left in the bucket that we maintain, utilize for future um, capital needs, uh, allocations, accumulations, so on and so forth. Foregone amount. One thing that uh, the city has done is, uh, as I indicated, you're allowed to levy taxes up to 3% of previous year's levy, budget amount, taxes levied. And if you choose not to take that, as the council did last year, the council elected not to take the full 3%. So those amount, that percentage of taxes which are authorized but are not taken are banked or put in a foregone amount that is maintained, the percentage is maintained by the uh, state tax commission. The council at any time, if they wish to utilize those funds, have to go back, have a separate public hearing, which would be at the same time that we have this public hearing, and would authorize taking those taxes. In the past, council has taken it for a couple of things. Replacement investment revenues for the Hamilton Fund in order to offset the cost of the uh, Hamilton, or excuse me, the uh, Hamilton Indoor Recreation Center when uh, Hamilton funds were used to pay off the, the uh, certificates of participation for that several years ago. To provide permanent funding for police officers that were grant funded positions and uh, if we wanted to uh, maintain those officers we needed to find funding, that's where that came from. Providing funding for the city's participation in the runway realignment project Pullman Moscow Regional Airport was one other place that the councils utilize those funds. In fiscal year 18, no foregone amount is proposed. The current available balance is $268,683. So if the council wanted to this year, at this time, or next year in this same time frame, could authorize going back and picking those up if they wanted. Uh, property tax revenues and CPI rate. As you can see, the property tax is here in the blue. CPI is in the gold. So you can kind of see from 2009, 2017, this is the period of the Great Recession. So as you can see, they're back on track <clears throat> going forward after seeing quite a disparity there from 2010 through 2015. <coughs> State sales, liquor tax, and revenue sharing. Uh, as I indicated during the original budget, uh, Good thing about Idaho is that people keep drinking in trying economic times and that generates taxes and those are shared with local government according to a uh, formula by the state of Idaho. So as you can see, evidence that the economy is improving slowly. 
So we continue to move forward there. And that's one of the reasons for the increased uh, funding in the general fund. Franchise fees, same thing. Uh, they're moving ahead as our population increases, as uh, the use of electricity or gas goes up. Typically what happens is um, if you have a hard winter, of course, you have more gas revenues, more electric revenues based upon that. We do see some trends in um, TV cable. A lot of people are taking advantage of online services or satellite which do not generate any franchise fees. So we've seen a dip in those because of the changes in technology. Building permit revenues are all over the board. You can blame Bill Belknap's department for that. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> they, are, they react to whatever the building trends are. And as you can see, in 2009, 2010, we had some fairly rocky times. We're starting to see the economy flatten out and improve and we expect that to improve into the future. But it was a significant amount, as you can see, uh, quite a difference over the years. Salaries, benefits, and employee programs. Cost of living increase based upon averaging the monthly CPI from March 19, or excuse, 19, 2016 to 2017 was 1.3% average. That is pr proposed as a uh, CPI for 2017, salary adjustments in our pay for performance plan and the step and grade plan for police is 3.5% for step and grade. It's a seven step system. When you reach the top step, you are eligible for cost of living adjustments only. Uh, in our AMPS program, under 100% of market, you're eligible for up to 4% based upon uh, performance. If you are at 100% or above, you are also able to participate, but it's at a much smaller percentage. Uh, we have a wellness program, a robust wellness program. We have a health plan that is finally starting to yield some fairly good numbers. Uh, we've seen in the remote past increases as high as 13 to 20%. Uh, we think we have a, a at least a an interim uh, solution to that, or um, at least we've held it at bay. The increase this year is 5.8%. Is we have a voluntary uh, employee benefit allocation or account for employees at $3 or $350. Excuse me, I'm trying to get through this fairly quickly. Um, that $350 per employee allows employees to offset the costs of deductibles or other health care costs or they can bank them for retirement. We also have a robust employee recognition program. Personnel changes, we have just a few of them. We have an administrative support specialist which is proposed in the fire department. This is a way for us to continue the volunteer nature of our volunteer cadre. The idea is that we have paramedics, we have EMTs who respond to uh, emergencies in the city. They're, they're volunteers. We'd like to get the paperwork off of them. They have a lot of records they need to keep. Also, somebody needs to order supplies for the ambulance, needs to inspect the ambulance, maintain the ambulance, those sorts of things. This is intended to allow our volunteer people to utilize their time for uh, the volunteer services that they render and not in bookkeeping. Increased seasonal support for parks and rec winter operations. I think it's pretty clear that this last year, um, it was a little bit out of sorts, but there was a expectation of the public that they wanted to have a uh, little higher um, frequency of snow removal from sidewalks and public areas. This is, allows for uh, the increase for that, and it is a part-time seasonal position, so it's not full-time. Community development intern. Uh, we've got a robust intern program. Uh, it's not highly expensive, but it's up here because it is an additional part-time position. Uh, community events division, this is the old uh, seasonal nine-month farmer's market manager as well as uh, community events manager has been rolled into a uh, single position and you'll see uh, farmer's market slash community, I think it's community events slash farmer's market department develop. So it takes that nine month position to uh, one FTE full time equivalent. General fund highlights, uh, streets fund, parks and rec fund, um, <coughs> We support, uh, general fund supports the street fund through um, 
allocations to the fleet fund, $120,000 a year goes directly from the general fund into uh, the fleet fund, cultural and recreation fund. That is what we indicated uh, has combined the parks and rec revenues with arts and community events. We also have the Moscow School District Community Play Fields Fund that uh, the cost of maintenance of those play fields is split with uh, School District 281. 1912 fund pays for the contract with Heart of the Arts and the Utilities uh, for the 1912. Fleet fund, as we indicated, emergency service vehicles, meaning fire trucks, $350,000 in this budget has been allocated for accumulation for that fire truck. We will, by the way, uh, be looking into the potential for applying for a community development block grant for fire truck funding. I want to thank Walter for helping us with that. Uh, we've been looking into that and we will try and determine if that's possible. If so, then uh, it will be paid for uh, with state grant funding. That is a competitive grant, so we're not getting our hopes up, but we sure hope we'll be able to, to do that. If so, it will allow us to stretch those tax dollars farther. 